Welcome to Breaking Bible with the Tully Adventurers. Explore! It's a good day for some good news. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's Jesus' good news to us in John 16, 33. As we face this new day and all it has for us, we find courage and hope in the only trustworthy words available. Tully Adventurers, explore. The Bible. This morning we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Ooh. Got a little whistle in that one. Yeah. <laughs> Thessalonians? Yeah. Yeah. Chapter 3. I was, I was yeah. blowing the whistle on that one. Yeah. So we listened to that already. And my love, by all means, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you today? Um, I need a minute. Okay. I, I really have enjoyed this. Go ahead and take the, your minute. I'll talk about what 2 Thessalonians is. So Paul has written two letters to the people in Thessalonica. It's a church. It's a group that is trying to follow after Christ while still living their day-to-day -day lives, doing their jobs, and being part of the world. And, you know, uh, my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes from the pastor I grew up under was, those people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. <laughs> we still have to live in this world even though we are believers and we are hoping for right relationship with God which will bring the kingdom of God onto earth which would be heaven and so in the first letter to the Thessalonians Paul wrote as a cheerleader hey you're doing a good job I'm with you keep going you know it seemed like these people are fairly dr driven by their emotions and people who are driven by their emotions can get so empathetic for individual people that they can get run over so Paul comes back with his second letter and says hey I still love you but y'all are messing up you need to get back on track get yourselves back right I want to get back to being your cheerleader and in order to do that we're gonna have to fix some of this stuff and so that brings us into this lovely chapter of Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, the second letter, and now that we've got some background and some some information to help us remember that we are just like the people in Thessalonians, we are just like Paul, who's writing a letter. Sometimes we take all of these different hats and put them on throughout our lives, and the whole purpose of reading this and listening to this is trying to understand who is God. How does he interact with us, and what can we learn in how Paul has written to these different people, and how these people have responded about how our lives are going to go as well? I love it that they're kind of in trouble right now. Paul's Paul's talking to them about some things that they're not doing right because I'm a I'm an old man now. I can't do nothing, and more often than not, it feels like I can't do nothing right, and I'm married to my wife, and so. <laughs> We, more often than not, feel like we can't do the right thing for each other. So I can definitely feel how the Thessalonians were feeling as they read this letter. All right, my love, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Um, I don't know what number we're on. That's okay. It's okay. It says, we showed you how to pull your weight when we were with you, so get on with it. We didn't sit around on our hands expecting others to take care of us. In fact, we worked our fingers to the bone up half the night moonlighting so you wouldn't be burdened with taking care of us. Mm. <clears throat> and it wasn't because we didn't have a right to your support. We did. We simply wanted to provide an example of diligence, mm. hoping it would prove contagious. <laughs> so for me in my life, what this makes me think of is that it's so easy to get caught up in, in doing for others mm -hmm. that you don't take care of yourself. Ooh, come on, speak to that. Um, and so on the outside, it seemed like I was taking care of myself, but I wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't, uh, you know, while I was busy taking care of everybody else, I wasn't eating well, I wasn't taking good care of my body. I wasn't, um, I remember one time I had, I wasn't feeling real well, mm -hmm. but I just kept going. Mm -hmm. And I knew I needed to go to the doctor, mm. but I just kept going. I kept going. I kept going for two weeks. 
until finally it was so bad I had to go into the doctor and the doctor yelled at me like scolded me wow and was like you know <clears throat> there are five markers for this thing that you have um, you have if, a specific yeah. diagnosis of a specific problem. Right. Okay, and there's five markers for it. There are five it. markers for it. If you have one of those, I need to treat you. You have four. Whoa. You are a day away from going to the hospital. Wow. And, and this was when you were in survival mode. You're the only one bringing money to yeah. your house. You've got two kids to take care of. Yeah. You have a spouse at this time? Maybe. Um, <laughs> You've got, but they're not really helping even if no. they are there there's stress from this other person who's yes. supposed to be there and so you've just been running yourself ragged I had a business I had I was more or less a single parent mm -hmm. um, I I had to take care of everything right my spouse wasn't working I, I had to do everything so you're just stressed because you're carrying the burden of everything yes. And how, how'd you get to that point? How'd you get to the place where you were the one who had to carry everything? Um, not knowing how to implement good boundaries. Not knowing how to communicate them. Not knowing how to say the word. No. Yes. That's the word. And, you know, just not knowing how to... <clears throat> just not knowing how to have healthy boundaries. Just mm -hmm. that concept was just so foreign to me at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, and I I would go to work, and I would, when I left work, I remember I would, um, like if I'd gone to a big event with Redkin, mm -hmm. with all my Redkin people, you know, it was so uplifting, and it was so, I wasn't responsible in that moment. I wasn't responsible for everything. Uh. And you know, these were top people in our field mm -hmm. and I just you know Redkin's always been so good about you know helping us work on our personal grounding and I would cry every time I left there of course because you were on a mini vacation from your real life and you were in a place where there was a structure set up that did not allow you to take on every single thing yes. you could do you, you could still I take tried. on more than you, I really than tried. you were supposed to you were trying to take on more than you were supposed to <laughs> is that what you're saying my, my big boss still laughs at me now mm -hmm. she's like yeah you'd be the first one there you'd be the last one to leave you always cried when you left she's like you helped me like pack bags for people like all Things kinds that Things were that were not your job at all, that were not in your lane. You were just trying, you were that crazy person on the freeway, swerving in and out of every single lane, trying to get past everybody, going so fast. Yeah. And now you're at the doctor's with four out of five things, and that means you're a day away from going to the hospital right. and being stuck there for a long time. So no one's going to be making the money. No one's going to be taking care of the kids. No one's going to be doing any of the things. This is twofold for me. Okay, tell me more. Um, if you are an emotional person, mm -hmm. like you, you lean towards your emotional side, um, it is easy to get into the belief that other people are responsible for your emotions. Mm. You make me feel like this. You. Is that a business deal you made in your head? I'm going to take care of all these things, so you need to take care of my emotions? Um, it, it looked a little more like, well, you did that, so you don't get to be mad at me for doing that. I don't understand. Um, Unpack that one for me. I need a second. I'm, I need yeah, a clock. Take a deep tongue. breath. I need a clock. You're, getting a little, <laughs> you're getting a little tense, baby, so take a deep breath. This is really good stuff, and you're on to something, but... Take, let, loosen up your shoulders just a little bit, you know, you know. Because I couldn't communicate good boundaries, I would do all these things for other people, and when they weren't reciprocated, I would feel disappointed. Mm. Mm. Okay. And so that was happening so often that I, um, it's almost like, it was their fault that I felt the way I felt. Ooh, that's what you told yourself. Yes. That's the lie that got into your yes. head. Yes. 
you're feeling this way because they're not doing as much as you do. Right. You're modeling what to do and how to do it, mm -hmm. so they should just naturally do as much as you're doing. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Was it even available for them to do? You said that at Redken, you're trying to take on more than you're supposed to. You're doing jobs that you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. Is it even possible for other people who are around you to help you out when you're the one taking care of everything? I think what would happen is they wouldn't a few times, mm -hmm. like in the beginning of whatever the situation was, and then I would just give up on them, and I would just do it. Mm -hmm. Because... It was less heartache and energy spent just doing it myself. Yeah. And I just, oh. I would find myself being so sad and so mm -hmm. disappointed. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I migrated towards work because, you know, when I'm doing hair behind the chair, you know, however many clients I have during the day, I'm good at that. I'm really good at that. And that became my sanctuary. I didn't talk about all my shit when I was at, at work so I could be happy and I could mm. get, you know, praise and my clients would get excited and hug me at the end and, you know, I'd get that, you know, five, six, seven, ten times a day. Um, so you're getting, just like a drug, you're getting a hit of happiness. Oh, yeah. But that hit of happiness is coming at the expense of you never get to talk about what's going on in your life. Yeah. There's no safe place for you to be real about who you are and what's happening in your life. Mm -hmm. And there's, because of that, there's no one who can talk to you about what boundaries are or how to implement mm -hmm. them or how painful it is when you first start trying to implement boundaries. Because for a lot of people, boundaries are how to get, get a protective space for yourself so that you're okay. For you, boundaries are how do I limit myself enough that there's space for other people? Is that accurate? Um, I don't know. I think I would have to ponder that one. I think so, but I'm not totally sure. Yeah. I know that I... I didn't know enough about boundaries. I didn't know about them at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I hadn't really seen that modeled at all. Um, you know, I come from a long line of women who worked hard. Mm -hmm. um, in our family, we lovingly call them tough broads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, my grandma was a single parent at a time when that was not acceptable. And, you know, she just muscled through it. And, um, you know, she was very much a, a pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of a lady. Um, my other grandma, uh, you know, she went back to college at 41. And, you know. I don't know. Oh, multiple, don't know. multiple degrees, taught at the college, like, amazing lady. And, you know, I looked up to that kind of perseverance, so I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And, Ooh, uh... That's tough. Yeah. That speaks to me about how our culture... I've said this before, but after World War II, women basically took over and started getting into the jobs. They got their votes. They got everything. And so... You know, we claim that it's a man's world, but in America, after World War II, the men were broken and couldn't live up to what was hoped for from them. I even think that in the 50s, women were already the ones who we were worshipping. And worship is just where we direct our belief or our hope towards. And so we had put our hope into women because realistically, after World War I, it was a mess. And so you look at the 50s and that ideal of having a, a home and a family and a picket fence, that goes very much against what um, men were known for in America. We were cowboys. And cowboys are the lonely one out on the plane, driving cattle, doing all this stuff, not really connected to a home. And so from the 50s till I'm not sure when, 
it seems like we put all of our hope into women are going to take care of everything. And because of that, what I'm hearing from you is the men weren't around and what was modeled for you was that women had to take care of everything. And so you, you worshiped it by calling it tough broads. We give nicknames to people we really are impressed with or we love or we care about. And so the nicknames for these women who were being worshiped was tough broad. And the idea is you've got to become a tough broad. But when you become a tough broad, there's no space for a man to do his part in the relationship. There's no space for your coworkers to make mistakes. You'll jump in and take over and do their job for them and then fix what's going on. You become the fixer, the, the tough one, the, the one who can get through anything. Um, but I've, I've got to ask you, because I actually kind of know the answer, but I, I'm wondering if you're putting it together. What happened to your back? I broke my back. I mean, you literally broke your yeah. back. And was it like some big accident? Did you fall? It was just this. You're shaking your head, but you got to say it out loud. Yeah, no, there was no. And I remember my doctors would all ask that, like, what happened? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Literally, it was the stress of putting everything on your own back mm -hmm. and not letting anybody else do any of the jobs. Mm -hmm. And that literally broke your back. I moved me and my kids twice by myself. Mm -hmm. Moved all the boxes, moved all the furniture, moved all the stuff. I, you know, I remember um, one of my good friends at Redkin, um, she was very much, like I looked up to her because she was a tougher broad than I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we would just grab up whatever box and move it. We would, you know, and like, like me, she'd be the first one there. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so yeah, I just, the wear and tear on my back. That's what I mean by I didn't take care of my body. I just, I wasn't aware of any limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just, no boundaries. You were going to control everything. You were going to take care of everything. And it literally broke your back. Really, I was heartbroken. And... Oh. Huh. I was trying to control everything else because I was heartbroken. What had broken your heart? My marriage was falling apart. <laughs> my um, my ex-husband um, had developed a bad addiction and uh, refused to work. Um, and there was nothing I could do to control that. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to control everything else. Um, you know, and I, I tried to get help. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that you can't, an addict can only, can, can only help themselves. You can't do that for them. You can't do that until they decide that it's an issue. It, it just is. Mm -hmm. and, and what's interesting is, so you had someone who was addicted to a substance. And so it's so easy for us to recognize that addiction because it's connected to a substance. Right. But what we don't recognize is that on the other end, there are people who are addicted to control. Yep. You know, we've talked about, the Bible tells us to die to ourselves daily. Every single day we have to die to ourselves. We have to give up, we have to surrender control to God of all these things that we don't have control over. Yeah. And yes, you might have been given responsibility and authority in certain places, in which case, in those places, God has entrusted you with that responsibility, whether it's your kids or your family Really, it's your own body, it's your own mind, it's your own soul. You are responsible to other people, but you're responsible for yourself. And so there are so many people who are addicted to control, who are addicted to their inner vows that say, I'm going to control the amount of suffering that I'm going through by 
telling people that they should do this, that, or the other thing. Telling, you know, <laughs> telling my spouse how to live their life. Telling them how they're supposed to take care of the kids. And I mentioned this the other day on our Monday maintenance. Um, on the Joe Rogan podcast, he had Jocko Willink, who is a leadership expert. He was a Navy SEAL. He, he taught how to do leadership. He teaches how to do leadership. And his main thing is the most amateur thing you can do as a leader is to tell people how to do the job. Great leaders say, this is our goal. We're working towards it together. And then they free up their people to do the job however they're going to do it so that you can achieve the main goal. And I hope I paraphrased all of that right. You can check it out and let me know if I was wrong. But um, my point is, when we see people who are addicted to a substance, it's so easy to judge them because it's a physical thing that we can see. And we don't always recognize the stress in people's shoulders, the tension in people's shoulders. They're carrying burdens that they were never supposed to carry because they're trying to control people and things that they don't have any control over. And like you have told us, it literally broke your back. Yeah, it did. And so that's, it is heartbreaking. And it does come from a place of pain. We get hurt. My, what I'm wondering is, what was the most important thing to you in that time frame? You mentioned work. Was it the most important thing to you? Was it your place of rest and refuge? Like that's, you've mentioned you kind of got away from everything. And so those work weekends were a thing. Like, it, it was my, it became my sanctuary. Right. And I, I described it like that often. Ooh. And so, you know, it, it allowed me to, like I said, I, I became addicted to, you know, those pats on the back and, and there's nothing wrong with doing a good job. Like I'm, I'm great at my job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Problem is when you're doing someone else's job. Yeah. So let um, me ask you this. At Go that ahead. at that time too, I was very much like a. I mean, my kids were pretty little, but I was very helicopter parent with mm -hmm. them at that time. Mm -hmm. Like, I would I would get freaked out over stuff real easy over them. Mm -hmm. um, so you described more because they were. They were what? The most important thing in my life. And I was terrified that something would happen to them. Trying to deal with their dad. Just, my life was a mess. It was a mess. And it's so easy to, to say to people, like, if your marriage was such a mess, why didn't you just leave right away I didn't want to I mean I didn't I, uh. so let me ask you this because everything you're saying makes sense all of your emotions are valid <sighs> you said that work was your sanctuary your kids mattered the most to you uh -huh. your family mattered the most it sounds like you were worshiping at the altar of the American dream. Yeah. If I can just get a job, a house with a picket fence, 2.5 kids, have a spouse who works and does all these things, if we can just get the American dream, then everything will be all right. Hey. Were you, what my question is, is do you think that or feel like you worshipped the American dream. I think that's probably accurate. Okay. That's probably accurate. You know, I, I, yeah. I ask because my, my heart is for the church. Mm -hmm. And I know that the church messes up all the time. It's hurt me. It's hurt everybody's been hurt by people in the church and by things that the church have done or things that people from the church have done. And so it is so difficult to 
put any hope in the church is going to teach us how to worship rightly and what to worship. And it is easy to worship the American dream, especially, I mean, I think almost every female that I have been around worships that American dream. I'm going to find safety. I'm going to find what I need when I've got a spouse, 2.5 kids, a house that I own myself. I mean, we still hear all of these people on the internet complaining about how they can't get a house because it's too expensive. They don't want to get married because they've seen how hurt our generation was yeah. by trying to be married. They don't want to have kids or they there's this push against the American dream. There's the push against science right now uh, of, you know, there's the flat earthers and the vaccine can't possibly be good or the vaccine is the most holy thing or there's we get so caught up worshiping all these different things. We worship the American dream. We worship science. We worship whatever it is that we think is going to save us from suffering. And the whole goal of the church is to show us that the ultimate way to live life is to be like Jesus, who accepted suffering. And his prayer was, in the garden of, before he went to die, was, God, if there's any way that I don't have to drink this cup of suffering, that I don't have to suffer this way, then let's do that. However, not my will, but yours be done. This acceptance of suffering, this acceptance that in this life there is going to be trouble, just like you said at the beginning, but take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. And the way to do that is align ourselves with God so that tune our hearts to God so that when the suffering comes, we can trust and believe and have hope. Not that at the end of it, our kids are still going to be in our house or our spouse is still going to love us or whatever it is, but that no matter what happens, when our kids are ready to leave the house, they're going to leave the house. When our spouse decides that there's some addiction, whether it's a drug or control or whatever it is that's more important to them than us, when we suffer through all these things, which we all do, we all have relationships that have fallen apart because someone was worshiping something other than God and was hoping to use us to get to that thing. And so when we come back into alignment with who God is, and we look at Jesus as our example, we understand that there's going to be suffering and that we can get through it and God will help bring us through it, but we're going to still suffer. Mm -hmm. And so I know that I really appreciate you opening up about all this. We've only got a little bit of time left. So I wanted to back up just a little bit. You were going through verses, I think about 7, 8, and 9. I want to put verse 6 in there. And I want to remember that we're talking, Paul's talking to people who are very empathetic, very emotion-driven. Um, they love people. They want to show that care and concern for every individual. And Paul says, our, in verse 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, our orders, backed up by the Master Jesus, are to refuse to have anything to do with those among you who are lazy and refuse to work the way we taught you. Who Don't permit them to freeload on the rest. This is a huge boundary. Is Paul teaching us how to have boundaries? It's stay in your lane. It's stay in your lane, exactly. And it's Paul saying, I know... Because I care about you and empathize for you, I know that you want to be so empathetic to everybody, to every individual, that you're going to forget about how it affects the group. And we're seeing that in American politics with how the radical left interact with the world. So concerned about individual or the minority group that they're forgetting how it affects the rest of the country and the the radical right is just as messed up and it's funny because you can see them all flip-flopping right now and things that used to be their concern are no longer their concern in so many ways um, 
you know, <laughs> used to be that the left was the government doesn't get to touch my body. I have my choices that I get to make about what happens to my body. And now it's the radical left saying you have to get a vaccine, put it in your body. The government said so. It doesn't really make sense, you know? <laughs> and so it's just wild right now. It's a wild time because every person who's been worshiping something other than God is having that thing ripped apart and fall apart in front of them and people are getting wild and crazy trying desperately to grasp onto i'm still right my way is still right this is still the right way to do it and they're getting so crazy that everyone can see you've lost your way and paul brings us back to the way because he's modeling for us exactly what he expects the people here to do which is to step back from their empathy and have compassion compassion sees the whole group compassion says yes I care about you as an individual and what you're doing is hurting the whole group it's detrimental to the rest of society the community the people around you your family even yourself and I really appreciate you telling us your story Jen because I mean this this book of the these two books of the Bible are directly to you. You love having a cheerleader. Am I wrong? Yeah. You're correct. Uh, you love having a cheerleader. You want you're very empathetic, you're very loving, and when you don't have boundaries around that, it becomes something that will literally break your back. I'm we're serious, right? You yeah. were laid up for a long time. Yeah, I was out of work for a year. Ooh. I had surgery on my back. I could not work. Ooh. Um, I had that thing stripped away from me and, uh, you know, I had still had to figure out how to take care of my kids and I was in a tough spot. I was in a tough spot. And because you had been someone who took care of everything, as soon as you weren't able to do, take care of anything anymore, there's a huge vacuum there and no one knows how to do anything because they haven't been allowed to do anything. And so that's another way that this empathy is can become problematic because what happens when you're not there to take care of pe the people that you claim you care about anymore, which is going to happen. It's the problem of the Oedipal mother. It's the problem of the tyranny of ma the matriarchy is I'm going to take care of you so much that you're not even going to be able to take care of yourself if I'm not there to take care of you. And it's heartbreaking. And we see it happening all over the place. Kids who are still in their, their family home up through the age of 30 plus. This is the tyranny of the matriarchy. And so Paul is reminding us, hey, empathy is a good thing as long as you limit it enough so that you don't hurt people and hurt the, the whole family, hurt the whole country, hurt the whole group. Hurt yourself. Hurt yourself because you don't have any limitations on it. Yeah. It's just like everything else in this world. We are in the tension between the two opposing forces. And when we let one of those forces, empathy instead of, or compassion, when we go too far either way, the right is so compassionate that it can sound like it's just hard, hard truth with no love. And, hey, you're just on your own and we'll just crush you by giving you so much freedom that you, can't, you don't know what to do. And the left then comes to the other side. We're going to take care of you so much that when we're not there to take care of you, you don't know what to do. Um, and we live in this tension in everything. Like I said, the favorite quote I have from my pastor is there are people who are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. We live in a tension between earth and heaven and we have to stay in the middle just like Jesus did. He would go away for a little while, re recover his relationship with his father, get some energy, and then he'd come back around people and pour out all that love from a place where he was balanced enough to not be so empathetic that one individual is more important than everybody and not be so compassionate that he just crushed everyone with the truth 
and that was a mess. And so we have our example of how to suffer, of how to have boundaries, of how to live in this tension. But it is a tension. And it's, it's a challenge to live in this tension. So I will ask you, my love, we're at the end of our time today. I hope you all have been blessed by this conversation, um, maybe felt some kind of way. Let God use those emotions to guide you to the places in your own reality where you're holding on to expectations versus reality that just aren't real. And so I'll end with 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 16. We're in the message version of the Bible. May the master of peace himself give you the gift of getting along with each other at all times, in all ways. May the master be truly among you. And we pray this for America right now in a time when we're so divided. We pray this for our world. Every person in the world, we pray that the master of peace himself will give you the gift of getting along with each other at all times, in all ways. We love you so much, God. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you give us peace. You give us hope. You give us strength. You give us gentleness. You give us kindness and self-control. You give us examples of how to have good boundaries and, and be loving to people. You're so good to us. Help us, in turn, to be good to you and to follow you. We love you so much. Amen. Amen. As we finish out today, we just want to remind you, you can come hang out with us, and there are so many ways, so please do. Follow and subscribe on Twitch to chat with us. Like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts from. Thanks for joining us on this adventure. Much love, Tully Adventures. Explore.